This is Randy Sullivan, the host of Bourbon Real Talk. I grew up in a small town and went to a small church where everyone looked and thought like me. Over the years, I've gotten to know and love people from all different walks of life. This has made my world bigger and richer. The secret ingredient in forming those relationships was getting to know people's real stories. That helped me to identify with them, have compassion on them, and eventually develop a real connection with them. We live in a disconnected world today, and I want to do everything in my power to build connections between individuals who may not have attempted friendship otherwise. I've observed this happening in the bourbon community on its own because whiskey naturally brings people together. Bourbon Real Talk hopes to combine the world's new passion for bourbon into an opportunity to bring people together. We will share some whiskey knowledge, some good drams, and some real talk. So sit back, pour a drink, and open your hearts and minds. You might just find yourself feeling more connected to the people in the world around you, all fueled by bourbon. Hello, everybody, at Bourbon Real Talk. You guys are in for a treat today. I apologize for the white balance in the background because the lighting is not ideal, but I did want to get the old still in the background. I'm recording live at Balcones Distillery in Waco, Texas, and I am with, are you the master distiller? It's a head distiller. I'm head here. distiller. I don't think I'm old enough to be a master, master distiller. I, you know what? I respect that because I see a lot of new cats coming in starting a distillery, they never made any whiskey, and they give themselves the title master, and look at you doing the right thing and feeling like you're earning it. I like that quite a bit. I think you, yeah, over a lifetime and a career, some maybe some people start calling you a master, then sure, I guess you, you know. You yeah, then you're the master, there, you know? right. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Um, so as you know, here at some, Someone Say Whiskey, or not Someone Say Whiskey, uh, here at Bourbon Real Talk, uh, we always like to start off with a little bit of a uh, bourbon porn, a little bit of a review. And so the reason why I'm here is DFW Whiskey Club has graced me with the opportunity to come here and do a barrel pick. Uh, David Burgos hooked us up and uh, set us up with this. And uh, the pick is actually for a San Francisco liquor store called Plump Jacks. They do sell online and they will deliver to your door and they have all kinds of awesome picks. Oh man, the police are coming by. I hope they're not looking for us. Lock the door. And so what I like to do when I do a barrel pick is we go through and we usually taste, you know, three, five, six, seven, eight barrels, something like that. And then at the end, there's all this like remnant whiskey that got left over that, you know, you, you just didn't drink at all. And I like to make what I call the infinity glass. And so that's what I got here. And we're going to see how this infinity glass <laughs> tastes. So not quite the dump bucket. The it's dump, basically the dump bucket. The dump bucket sans saliva. Sand saliva, right? But it's also got the, uh, you know, these are the these are the honey barrels, right? Because you guys don't just throw out any nonsense when people want to select a barrel, and so these are probably, you know, this might be a pretty damn good blend. Every time I've had the uh, Infinity Glass, it's it's been pretty good. Yeah, I guess that's the whole idea, right? That theoretically, you would do a blend correctly, it should be better mm -hmm. than the parts, you know, and the parts by themselves don't have to be balanced. They're intended to be kind of accentuated in a certain way or strong and not necessarily super well-rounded, but that's why they're interesting, right? Right. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that we talked about when we were on this tour was uh, the difference between being like the distiller and the influence that you have on the whiskey and the, the blender, right? Because in Scotland, the blender is kind of the famous person in the operation. In the United States, we put a lot of emphasis on uh, the distiller. But uh, I don't know shit about, about blending. <laughs> and so I just throw stuff together. And then uh, because my palate's not that sophisticated, I didn't really like it as long as the components were good. Yeah. Um, and so on this one, uh, and, and what I'm finding is um, there's, there's kind of a, there's a theme to a lot of, of your, you know, corn-based whiskeys. Mm -hmm. um, they're sweeter. Tons of caramel. Tons of caramel right? Um, lots of brown sugar, chocolate nib, um, uh, caramelized sugar. So think of like the layer of the top of creme brulee, right? Tasting a lot of that. Um, 
lots of chocolate, a little bit of like blood orange or orange flavor. So there's some fruit in there. Um, am I missing anything? I've heard people mention nuts a lot. Yeah. And maple syrup comes up. You know, Ma pancakes, oh, yeah, maple syrup. I'm sorry. I, I left that out. That is like the main component is maple syrup. And that's what I'm getting on this one. Other interesting thing about this is that when we did this tasting, we had, uh, uh, was it five? We had five. We started with five. Five yeah. whiskeys to, to go through. And uh, this was the first time that the tasting panel didn't immediately eliminate two to three because all of them were good. There were some differences. And a lot of those differences turned out to be um, barrel differences. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the things that I wanted to talk with you about was that Texas whiskey, from what I'm learning, seems to be more grain focused. So what are you tasting, first off, while we're in the bourbon corn section? I'm drinking, I'm drinking the barrel pick from today. Oh, okay. Um, so number three, 16009. Um, European oak, yeah, golden promise, hundred percent golden promise, single malt. Um, I don't know what the age ranges were, you know. I mean, I, it was I like it was like twenty seven months. <clears throat> I know they were all straight. Yeah, plus, yeah, twenty seven months. Hungarian oak, yeah, yep. um, which I learned today. So you've got American oak, which adds a lot. American oak has a a high content of vanillin mm -hmm. uh, compounds, uh, which is where our flavor vanilla comes from. Um, French oak has more tannic, bitter flavors that it imparts. Um, and then Hungarian oak is like this, the, like the good looking love child of those two. Yeah. Is yeah. that fair to say? Yeah. I always pick up a lot more, uh, like stone fruit specifically with the mm -hmm. European, but it's got plenty of vanilla and caramel and toffee and all those normal American things. It still has a decent tannic backbone, but then there's some notes that are just kind of hanging out that aren't usually there. Like gotcha. The other two species. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So I, I like everything that we tried. Uh, lots of uh, brown sugar, of course, maple syrup all day, every day, beautiful. And so as the uh, lead distiller, um, what percentage of your time do you think you spend like actually functionally distilling the whiskey? And what percentage of your time do you think you spend dealing with like the blending and maturation and that? Way more of it on blending and maturation. Um, we were talking about this earlier, but the, the head distiller role has, at least the way I exercise it, I guess, mm -hmm. is um, a lot of product development, procedure, all the technical stuff on pitching rates and starting gravities and final pH and all these nerdy things, helping to find that if we have a new product. And then it's the tail end when we're actually like we're getting barrels they're ready to use how are we going to blend these what what's the final product going to be like um so there's a bunch of stuff that happens in between those two brackets but things kind of i get to have the very start and the very end kind of um those those points is where i'm like most engaged um i mean we've got guys that are trained they know how to make the cuts the way we want the cuts made i've got guys that help me with blending obviously um I, I, I'm not super fond of um, the kind of cult of personality thing that goes along with a lot of distilling stuff. Um, even Hall of Famers that we all know and recognize mm -hmm. their names and their brands. There's a million people behind the scenes that are helping to make that happen. Of course. Yeah. And Brent Elliott's a good example. Took over for Jim Rutledge at Four Roses. I knew him before. He was already doing a ton of the work. Oh, sure. Um, with a crew of people, with a whole panel full of people. Um, so that master distiller title for some of those brands and some of the – is just kind of like the final like feather in the hat. Like you've already been doing this and nobody even knows who you are. And it's the same here. There's a ton of people doing a lot of work. Um, so yeah, being head means like, I always joke that it, yeah, that means whatever. If there's something's wrong with it, it's my fault. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's just, you know? That's a fair yeah. characterization. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, 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 uh, I own my own business. So I, you know, people say like, oh, it's good to be king. And I'm like, not when shit's going sideways. <laughs> There's no one else to blame. Uh, yeah. So no, I, I, I totally get that. And so I, as I have, because I mean, as recently as, you know, just a few weeks ago, when I trained my palate to whiskey, because I started in wine and um, I used to, I, I bought one of those smelling kits that had like 36 mm -hmm. or however many different yeah. vials of different smells. And I would watch TV and I'd smell them and I would call them blind. And if I got them right, I put them in the wind pile. If I got them wrong, put them in the loose pile. 
And then I'd keep doing the loose pile until I got them all right. Right. And that's how I train my, my nose. Cause I don't have a very good palate. Like I, I know that about myself, but I've worked hard at right. it so I can do, I can do okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, I've gone through that process and then I kind of switched over to whiskey, but when I switched to whiskey, I trained my palate with Kentucky bourbon. Mm -hmm. Right. And what I'm starting to learn is, is that Kentucky bourbon is more, the flavors seem to be more focused on the maturation, like the aging process and more of what the barrel adds to the whiskey and less about the grain. I think mm -hmm. that there's even been some quotes recently from Master Distiller saying that 70% of the flavor of the whiskey comes from the barrel. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's a fair statement as like the lead distiller of probably the most prominent Texas distillery? I mean, New Oak in general, yeah, it's by nature, it wants to dominate um, what you put in it. So um, yeah, it's, it's hard to avoid how much the wood, and not just the wood extraction, but the interaction between the wood and the spirit, which is kind of like a third member of the equation. You have the new make, you have the barrel, but there's something that happens in between those two that's greater than the sum of those parts. And we've talked about oxidation and esterification, things like that. But yeah, I'm, the, the subtlety of a used refill, you know, ex bourbon cask or something for Scotland compared to what Virgin Oak is going to do. Um, to an American whiskey style that requires new oak, which means you need to pay a lot of attention to the barrel, right? Yeah. Um, and which is another aside. I, I don't know that for as big as a, it, the contribution the barrel has is so huge. And I don't, I don't know that enough people are spending enough time considering what does that mean? And therefore what kind of wood thickness, grain density, how long it's been dried, if it's kilned, if it's steamed, Stave count, all that other stuff. That like, well, what if the barrel is the most important part? Then, yeah, go down the rabbit hole with <laughs> barrels, right? Right. And figure out what's possible. Which we're drinking European oak, which is one good example of just something we got just because it was available. Right. We were so curious. Like, wait, we can buy that. What does this do? Yeah, we'll send some on. We're right. gonna put, and we put probably five or six different grain bills into those barrels the first time around before we figured out. Oh, wow, it really does well with this. And eh, it doesn't really help much with this one. Um, those kinds of things, and then you add, you add toasting, and um, the yard aging, like I mentioned, a few other things like that into the mix, and you, all of a sudden, you have dozens, if not hundreds, of variables to work with, which is fascinating and right. super fun. And that's just the, that's just the barrel. We that that's, that's just barrel. We right. haven't even talked right. about the the grain. Right. So, so with regard to the barrel, he he mentioned toasting. So for those of you who are not super experienced, um, so everybody talks about you know number four alligator char. Right. Everybody understands, you know, they burn the shit out of the inside of the barrel and it looks like alligator skin because they burn the shit out of it. You can burn it so much the barrel fucking falls apart. Like you can do that. Right. But there's another process called toasting that was developed, I believe, by um, was the international stave. What's the uh, I mean, toasting has been done. Well, we can do that. But independent stave. Is who we independent do that. stave. That's what I meant to say. Mm -hmm. So independent stave did all of these research studies that showed that if they bring the barrel up to this temperature and they hold it for this temperature for a certain amount of time that it causes these chemical inter interactions to happen. And my understanding is that it was mostly for the wine industry. So they were trying to de develop like, how do we add cocoa flavor? How do we add caramel? How do we add uh, van vanilla? How do we do this? And now uh, bourbon uh, distillers and, and whiskey distillers are starting to take advantage of that technology especially Texas distillers, um, which is adding a whole nother layer of complexity, not even considering the grain. So what do you guys do with your barrels that are maybe a little bit different regarding toasting, what level char, that type of thing? Um, <clears throat> we usually go a pretty medium to medium light on the char. Uh, I feel like this is a, a really big area that people don't always understand. The char is activated carbon. Okay. So Anybody who likes camping and stuff like that, activated carbon will make undrinkable water safe to drink. Activated carbon is what they use to filter out vodka and make it tasteless, odorless, super, super, super clean, right? Right. So everyone's always talking about the char. The char is not adding anything to your whiskey. It's a filter. We just made a wood filter to take things out. But what happens right behind that, the heat affected zone, the red zone, um, that's the toast. 
So if you do burn the crap out of a barrel and make it an alligator char, you didn't, that's what people are talking about. But while you're doing that, you're caramelizing a bunch of hemicellulose and lignin, wood sugar behind it, just like caramelizing creme brulee, just mm -hmm. like caramelizing onions at home. You're taking all the sugar and caramelizing it right behind the char, and that's where all the color comes from. That's where all these different flavors are going to come from. Um, and Independent Stave, they did a bunch of really pretty um, well-documented stuff with Buffalo Trace back in the day, and they've done all their own research, especially with the wine industry, um, on time and duration on, on what different flavor and aroma compounds you're making available that are alcohol or water soluble, um, things that can affect everything from the mid palate mouthfeel texture all the way from spin, uh, the, how much spice is gonna last through the finish, um, smoke notes, if the fruit is gonna read orchard, green apple, pear, or if it's stone, or if it's like berries and dark stuff, plum, pretty much anything you can imagine that's a whiskey note is something that you can, you can't completely just make it show up from nowhere. Right. But you can accentuate things in a very specific way. Um, With different toasting patterns. Including like how long the finish is or like how the mid palate feels. So um, when we found out all that was possible, but they weren't doing that stuff for whiskey people, they were doing it for winemakers. It was just kind of a no brainer. Like, well, we, we have to at least get some of those. So we currently are using probably about nine to 12 different toast and char profiles, time and temperature profiles. Um, and then if you mix in using American, European, and French, um, there's a lot of variation. <laughs> I'm not a mathematician, but yeah, there's a bunch of options there. Right. Um, you were asking me earlier about rotating barrels in a warehouse, and I fully respect people that do that, and that creates a lot more efficiency and consistency across the barrels, which means when it, times, when it comes time to blend, they're a lot more similar. But we kind of take the opposite approach. We try to diversify it as much as possible. So when it comes time to put a bottling together, your color palette of what you have to paint with is just like nuts. enormous. And yeah. It's everywhere, which sometimes means it's hard. You might need something and you don't have it, hmm. you know? And I wish I had a few more barrels of a certain type of a certain age and they're not there. And you have to kind of just make adjustments to uh, take, take that into account. But um, if everything was coming off the, out of the warehouse, pretty much similar. I don't know why we just wouldn't just dump it. Why yeah, dump why, it off. Why right. bother smelling and tasting it, right? Right. So, well, I'd and, be bored also. And, <laughs> right. And so that's that's one of the other things that we talked about, right? Because when you guys run a, a batch, how many how many barrels are involved in those batches? Um, we get about somewhere between eight and ten barrels off the still. No, no, no. I meant like when you're making a, a run, like which, one of your, your standard products when you're doing your blending, how oh, many blending? barrels? Uh, these days, probably a like smaller. 80? 80 would be a pretty big one, yeah. yeah. Okay. So 50, to, 50, 50 to 80, to 80. is pretty normal, yeah. Yeah. And so um, how big for a huge distillery, like regular Buffalo Trace I don't product? even know. It's enormous, right? I'm sure it's massive. I mean, I've had guys, I know people, I know, some, know a guy that works at Dean Suntory who was joking one time that, one of their one of their releases that comes out every year that's like the small batch was like bigger than our annual production. Oh that's right, hilarious. right, yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, so. I've I've been at a recent recently I've been at a Texas distillery, not this one because you guys are a relatively high production, but they said uh, that Buffalo Trace spills more whiskey per year than they make. I'm sure. So yeah, I'm sure. So <clears throat> if you think about that, if if your what's your the grain that you're using isn't contributing it's only contributing your distillation process in the grain is only contributing 30%, right? And you, and 70% is coming from the barrel and you always use the same type of barrel. You don't variate the char. You don't variate the toasting. This is Randy Sullivan with the Randall Sullivan home selling team and the host of bourbon real talk. Producing a podcast is time consuming and expensive. And Bourbon Real Talk wants to maintain its integrity by not promoting products and services that it doesn't believe in. For this reason, I've opted to have my real estate team sponsor this program. The Randall Sullivan Home Selling Team has operated since 2008. We've sold almost 500 homes. We have proprietary programs that make a massive difference to the outcome of our clients, and we service the entire North Texas area. If you live in North Texas and you need to buy or sell a home, please give us a chance to explain how our services could benefit you. 
We understand that not all of our listeners live in North Texas. We also know that not all real estate agents are created equal. If you need a real estate agent outside of North Texas, the Randall Sullivan Home Selling Team has access to tools to help you find a highly qualified agent in your area. The service is free for you, and we stick around through the end of the process to help you with your transaction, even when we're not your agent. If you have a real estate transaction in your future, please reach out to us at randallsullivanteam.com, Facebook, Instagram, or just give us a call at 214-385-9101. Don't vary the toasting and you always age in the same facilities and you're, and you're dumping, you know, a thousand plus barrels. There's going to be consistency, right? And that, and that going to like, yeah. And most of those guys have done it long enough too, where they know what parts of the warehouse at what age. So they kind of have a formula for, let's say, I don't know, something like 60% of the recipe is this age at this part of the facility. And then we want a little bit, we want 8% of these really older ones that are from this one corner of the warehouse. And, you got it all figured out, and if the bottling is big enough, it's probably going to mostly it's gonna be average consistent. out, right? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, for those of you who haven't figured it out yet, he actually talks to these people, so he's not talking out of his ass. Yeah. Uh, off camera, he he mentioned some conversations that he had that I don't think we should mention on co- camera um, of like literal superstars that you all would all know, and you know, he's not making this shit up. So that's how all this stuff works. But here, it's a little bit different. There's a little bit more of a manual hands on process that you go through when you're blending your batches, because you are trying to hit profile. And you don't have a production style that produces exactly consistent whiskey. So you do have to manipulate it a little bit, right? And like I said earlier, I I mean, we look forward to it. I'd rather do that. I think pot still versus column. Column creates a much more consistent, uniform, um, the day-to-day variations um, on the still with the new make are different, much much more exaggerated on a pot still. Um, so if you're doing column bourbon, for example, I, I think most of your variation you're introducing, which you can't control for, is the barrel. And that's an agricultural product that varies season by season, different parts of the country, rainfall, soil conditions, all that stuff. So you limit that. The barrel is the really the big question mark. A continuous column is conti- is creating some pretty pretty consistent, pretty uniform product. Right. You do you do pots distillation, you do batch. Now every day is different, and then you add <laughs> intentionally, but you know we added a bunch of other variables that aren't even necessary that make it more complicated <laughs> with, with the oak species and the pros, the tar right. profiles. But um, it's more, even if we're doing a new a virgin oak product, it, it, the blending process is a lot more akin to something like scotch where they don't all behave the same because they're different days, um, different fermentation parameters, different oak species, all that stuff comes into play. Um, but I also, a lot of people that are into whiskey are also into food. They're into wine. They're into beer. They're into whatever. Um, and I always equate um, some of these really, really massive brands, or even the frustration that I hear from consumers when they pick up a bottle and it's slightly different from what they've had before or from what they were expecting. It's not a perfect correlation, but it always reminds me of like Chili's or Applebee's or something. Right. I can go everywhere, anywhere in the world, and I can find that it's restaurant, and it's going to be exactly the same. Which, I don't eat at places like that. Sure. I show up in a new place, and I ask the locals, or I get on Yelp, or whatever, and I want to find out, what's the crazy, weird little hole-in-the-wall thing with there's seating for 12, but I'm going to have a killer taco, or I'm going to have some great barbecue, or I'm going to have some ramen, whatever. So I'd, I've had to kind of retrain myself, even, to think about whiskey like that. If the last batch, even something massive, Last batch of Ardbeg 10, if I put two side by side and there's slight differences, I, ca- I start getting excited about that. Right. We were talking earlier uh, with some of the other guys that were here about music, and um, fans do the same thing to artists as, they're, as they age and their creative vision evolves and changes, and everybody wants to give them shit later. Like, oh man, the stuff four years ago, eight years ago, was so much, I, what's he doing now? I don't know, what, what is he playing with? And it turns out he's always wanted to do a country album. Right. <laughs> like, let him. Right. Like, so what? He's let an artist. It, right? right. You loved everything you did before, and then you took a turn you weren't ready for. 
Um, anyway, I, I feel like that, that, that over homogenized, um, I don't think that helps us. Right. I don't think that helps that move the needle. humanity going forward right. to have, I'm expecting things that meet my expectations, that are familiar. I mean, yeah, bigger picture culturally, that's, that's what leads us into a lot of weird problems when these are me and mine, I'm familiar with this, this is comfortable, this isn't challenging. Like, is that really what we want in our whiskey and bigger picture? Is that really what we want culturally going forward? continue to narrow our view as opposed to like a broadening view that it takes into account new experiences, alternate opinion, you know, like different right. perspectives. So you don't know this, but the reason why my podcast is called bourbon real talk is not because I interview uh, lead distillers. <laughs> like this is actually off. This is off profile for my show. Okay. My, my show is what I realized is that with, with, by the way, we're at a working distillery that's downtown. Yeah. So we've had fire trucks. Now we've got a, a train. We are having like people walk into the fucking distillery. Like it's just the way that it is. If you're hearing noises, you're just getting part of the experience. So Bourbon Real Talk, what I realized is that whiskey is a shareable product. So I used to collect wine and I opened up this really fucking expensive wine one time. And me and my buddy split the bottle. We drank it in about an hour mm -hmm. and it was gone, right? And then I realized, you know, you can open up a bottle of whiskey and share it with a lot of people over a long period of time before it actually changes. Mm -hmm. And since I'm very social, I like that. But I also realized that whiskey kind of brings people together. You know, um, I've had some weird experiences where I went to go camp out outside of a store to get like, you know, an allocated bottle. And I didn't know those people, yeah. but we were like brothers, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, people buying each other food and helping each other out and all that stuff. And so I realize bourbon brings people together, but our world is very divided, right? And, and there's a lot of people that are, are benefiting by that division um, politically, yeah. economically, yeah. economically, politically. And I don't like that. Mm -hmm. Like I, I have friends of all walks of life. Like, it, like if no one else loves you, I love you. You just need to know that. Like mm -hmm. I love gay people. I love minorities. I love what, whatever your category is. If someone else doesn't like you because you're in that category, I love you. That is the purpose of the show is to use whiskey to bring people together through, through really sharing people's stories. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, even though like interviewing lead distillers is not necessarily the main, you know, focus, what I've, somehow there's a dragon. Yeah, I think we've got a baby dragon. There's like a baby dragon. Like I watch Game of Thrones and that's what dragons sound like. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so somehow like, <laughs> I feel like there's kind of a bias or a prejudice against Texas whiskey. Yeah. And so I want to use uh, the platform that I'm trying to build to educate people. Right. And so we've talked a lot about the maturation process and how um, there's some toasting differences and things like that. Um, let's talk about what, what is your, your angel share per year on, on average, do you think? Uh, first year is closer to like 11, 12. Mm -hmm. The first year is always the worst and really like, what's considered the angel share. A lot of that's just, if you have a virgin barrel, a lot of that's just absorption. So a good four or 5% gets soaked into that barrel. You just never get it back. Right. Um, but usually by a year, like if we dump something that's two to three years old, it's uh, at least, at least 25% loss. Mm -hmm. And I've got a couple of single barrel, single malts that are five years old this year that I'm going to put in the gift shop later um, in the, in the fall that are like a third full, you know? Wow. Um, which is always a funny one when people say, oh, when are you guys going to do like a 10 or 12 year old? <laughs> you I, can't. I have two options. <laughs> I can use, if I pull out some samples from the checkout, if I have stuff that's three, four or five years old, they're either black, like so like complete wood bomb, tannic, spicy, not right. drinkable, look not like enjoyable. Coffee. Right. Yeah. Opaque. Like they look yeah, like a soda or they're light and they're beautiful and they're gorgeous. And there's like 50 bottles in here. Right. You know, there's almost nothing left. So those are, your, those, are your, those are your options. But I'm playing with entry proof. I'm playing with some things to minimize evaporation, to allow for longer um, maturation. Obviously, with corn whiskey and malt, we can do some used barrel stuff. So we're, um, I think the lowest entry proof thing I've played with, we've got some malt that went in at 96. Oh, wow. Um, and we're just going to see. Like, so yeah, I kind of have this weird working hypothesis. So in Scotland, anywhere from like 62, 63, 
uh, percent going in the barrel up to 70, even higher. And then over years and years and years, it's dropping. So I was, one, I was like, well, what if here our ABV climbs? What if we started low? And let it and climb. And let it climb and just kind of invert the process. And don't add water. Don't add water. Just let it keep climbing. And would we end up with something similar to it, like an upside down version of that same maturation? Instead of fighting our climate, learning to play with it, learning how it works, and then making some different process decisions to take advantage of it. But it'll be years before we know. But that's, right. It's a... Uh, yeah, it's 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 been pretty interesting so far. Are you guys picking up on this? <laughs> like, so read a book, right? You get a book, and you read a book about how bourbon is made, right? And you read all this stuff, and you get done with your book, and you're like, you know what? I'm a bourbon PhD. Ask me questions. But what you don't understand is that there's so many layers of complexity, and there are like mavericks out there that are that that don't you know, they don't have the same equation to play with that you have in Kentucky, right? So here we are in Texas, it's way hotter here. And so he's trying to make something that's beautiful and expressive. And, and, you know, there's this concept in wine called terroir. That's the, it's the sense of the place of where the grain, not the grain, but the grapes came from. And there's a terroir to Texas whiskey. And no one has figured out how to express that yet and so there are people out there like this gentleman that are putting in the hard work that are trying to figure out how to express that in its best expression and you guys are in this weird position that you get to experience that process and so please don't just thumb your nose at that don't just like think that it doesn't matter it doesn't matter like he's he, like he he it matters he he's dedicating his life to try to figure this problem out and i promise you that it wasn't that long ago that gentlemen didn't drink scotch or sorry didn't drink bourbon they only drank scotch because scotch was what gentlemen drank right scotch was like the fancy man's whiskey and now all of a sudden we've all realized that you can make beautiful bourbon in the United States, in Kentucky. We've all trained our palates for it. But that doesn't mean that that's the only beautiful expression of whiskey that can come out of the United States. And just like there's been a shift from Scotch to Kentucky bourbon, there will also be a great awakening where we all realize that good whiskey, even though it's different, can come from different regions. And you just have to decide. Are you going to get it on the right side of history? Are you going to be the guy that is embarrassed because, you know, when you're older in life, you poo-pooed all this stuff and said that it wasn't good? Because these people are sacrificing literally everything, sacrifices that you wouldn't even want to think about to try to figure these things out, and they're doing it for you. And so open your minds. Judge things based on the way they taste because they're doing some really, really amazing stuff. And every time that I think that I understand whiskey, I go and I talk to somebody like this gentleman, and I realize I don't know shit. Like, you can read a book, but that doesn't teach you anything, right? Like, almost everything that you drink comes out of column still, right? That includes the, 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 so you got the head, the heart, and the tail, right? And so in the column still, it runs continuously. So they don't have cuts. So you're drinking acetone, you're drinking other things. This guy's running a pot still, and he's got to figure out where the cuts are. He's got to decide, how do I want my barrels toasted? Do I want to age them here or do I want to age them there? How old do I want to age them, right? If you've got, you know, 11% angel share the first year, you can't do a 12-year bourbon. Everybody loves, you know, you want to go out and run, run out and buy well or 12. If you're using 11% per year, what's 11 times 12? What percentage will be left? You'd have tons of phantom barrels, and what would be left would be garbage. So please, stop thinking about age statements. Age statements don't tell you anything. Let your palate do the evaluation. Just taste it, right? Because, in, and in my opinion, Texas bourbon, while you guys are doing some really fucking awesome stuff with, like, the maturation process, um, which, by the way, uh, one of the things I want to talk with you about with regard to the maturation process. So you guys are toasting your barrels 
but you you guys also have a greater number of staves in your average barrel. So tell the people about that. Um, yeah, one of the kind of misconceptions is as the interaction with the atmosphere is happening from the spirit and the headspace inside the barrel and the air in the warehouse, that, that most of that's happening through the wood. Some of that is happening through the wood, but the large majority of it is happening on the seams in between staves. Um, and once again, Independent Stave knows this, Buffalo Trace knows this. They paid for a lot of research to come up with some of these, these concepts, which kind of turned into a no-brainer for us because in Texas, our, our wood extraction, the extraction part of the aging process is easy. With our temperature swings, it's no problem. We're going to get plenty of wood. How does the rest of maturation keep up with that part? And um, so, yeah, we most we were saying earlier, but most bourbon barrels are 28 to 28, 32, 32 stave. Um, we pay a little bit extra. It means a lot of our staves are really, really skinny, but we have 39 to 42, 43 usually um, to increase those number of seams so that our oxidation, maturation, esterification, all that stuff can happen. Um, and hopefully, fingers crossed, try and keep up pace with how fast the extraction of wood compounds goes. Right. So my understanding is, is that if you're making a Kentucky bourbon, a lot of your flavor is coming from the barrel. And a lot of the chemical reactions that happen between the whiskey and the wood take time. Some of them have to do with uh, uh, the interaction between the char and the liquid. And some of them have to do with interactions between oxygen and the liquid. Mm -hmm. So you can speed up the interaction between the oxygen and the liquid. You can speed up the interaction between the char and the liquid by either having greater temperature swings or greater surface area contact by using smaller barrels. But there's nothing that you can do to mimic the chemical reactions that only happen with time, right? And so that's why I think that Texas bourbon is trying to get more of its flavor from the grain because we're not going to be able to age whiskey for 20 years here unless we put it in a temperature controlled environment. Right. And so, because we'd end up with the angel share that we right. lose here through natural processes, we're, we're going to end up with nothing. So do you feel like it's fair to say that Texas whiskey is more grain focused and less barrel focused? This is Randy Sullivan with RSHST Capital LLC and the host of Bourbon Real Talk. Producing a podcast is time-consuming and expensive, and Bourbon Real Talk wants to maintain its integrity by not promoting products or services that it doesn't believe in. For this reason, I have opted to have my funding company sponsor this program. RSHST Capital is the first-of-its-kind funding company that provides pay at close funding to home sellers out of their equity. If you have a home to sell, need money for renovations or repairs to maximize your profit, money to stop pending foreclosure or to keep your mortgage current, or cash for really anything, then look into RSHST Capital. This program is simple. We verify that you have equity, approve you for a funding amount, you have access to that cash at practically a moment's notice for only a nominal fee. This program is raising sellers cash after closing by tens of thousands of dollars, stopping foreclosures and changing people's financial future. You pick your real estate agent, your contractor, and have access to actual cash or contracting expenses with zero upfront cost. This is a nationwide program. So if you have any curiosity about how it works, please look us up at rshtcapital.com, Facebook, or just give us a call at 214-385-9101. So because we'd end up with the angel share that we right. lose here through natural processes, we're, we're going to end up with nothing. So do you feel like it's fair to say that Texas whiskey is more grain focused and less barrel focused? I don't think it's any less barrel focused. Um, it definitely tends to be more grain forward and a lot of, a lot of wood extraction. Um, we're going back to even the stave count or even some of how we run fermentations to try and create, um, if you're, well, there's a ton of things that are happening during maturation, but if you're waiting for the barrel to clean stuff up, 
if you're waiting for really heavy solventy stuff to evaporate off and exit the barrel, or if you're waiting for the char layer to filter out some of your heavier molecular weights and your fattier um, tails kind of notes, then that needs time. Right. So one of our solutions was just don't put that shit in there. Right. <laughs> I mean, you just saved yourself a step. Right. So now we're not waiting for the whiskey itself to get dialed in and cleaned up on the top end and low end. We're not doing a low pass, high pass filter on the audio. Put it in the way you pretty close to how you want it. Now we're waiting for wood extraction to happen and we're waiting for oxidative and uh, esterification stuff to happen, which another trick to speeding that up, it doesn't actually speed it up. But if you start with a higher um, amount of acids available to be esterified, if you have a little bit and you're waiting for all of them to turn into good, really cool fruit and floral notes, that could take time. Or you could start with a lot. And then it's shorter. And then it's shorter because you just gave it all the fuel that that process needs to transform weird funky acids in the wash into really cool stuff in the barrel just feed the fire nice um so our phs are low we let our fermentations go long there's obviously no boiling going on so we've got plenty of lactic acid activity lactic bacteria activity our fermenters are open in the environment so we see some seasonal changes with with uh, wild yeasts and uh when things are blooming and whatever's going on in the environment we end up with wild yeast and other bacteria that get in there and kind of sour things up and make it a little funky um but later that turns into a lot of really really nice stuff so nice. unique stuff yeah you want it you want it in there and you don't have to wait 10 12 years to get it if you just bump up those levels to begin with right know? so for those of you who are paying attention um you can make okay distillate and you can put it in uh standardized barrels that all receive the same process you can age it for 10 to 12 years in kentucky and you're gonna make badass whiskey uh that's not an option in texas because there wouldn't be any lift whiskey left. So what is a better process is be more intentional about the distillate that you produce. The variables that you can control, like oxidization, pay extra money for your barrels so that there's more staves because the greater number of steves or staves will increase the oxygen interaction with your distillate while it's aging. And you know, get as much of that as you can but the end product is actually supposed to taste different and it should. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I use rye as a good example, but you know, we released a rye, it's been out for, I guess just about a year now. Um, and people say, you know, to watch people react to a new product on the market from a, from a smaller producer and all of their expectations about what a rye should or shouldn't be. And you can kind of see, Who's comfortable with like, oh, well, I've never had anything like this and give it a chance versus someone who's expecting something. Um, but I think it was Mark Gillespie from Whiskey Cast that was one of the, he's like, well, just remind people that it's A, made on a pot still, which they've probably never had a rye made on a pot still. Right. Unless they've had it from another craft producer. And B, you know, 70 to 80% of the rye they've ever had is made at the same place in Indiana. Right. <laughs> so they think, yeah just one a couple steps down on like how informed the whiskey consumer is they've grown accustomed to rye for example just one example tasting a certain way and it's like yeah that's one place mm -hmm. um, that supplies a lot of people and so you've grown accustomed to these mint notes and the spice a certain way and dill and the dryness and the yeah. dill and all that. so there's a little bit of that there's education which i mean people like you i'm and trying viewers help because the conversation matters it's a dynamic trade it's obviously right now in the last decade it's changing and changing rapidly um and it doesn't mean we have to accept everything that craft is throwing at us just like with craft beer i mean i've sure. been in that world for almost two decades now um and no small producers still make bad stuff like it doesn't mean we have to like rubber stamp everything that's happening right because it's craft it's not good but but to say it's not kentucky bourbon like yeah it's right. not kentucky bourbon to say our single malt is not scotch yes it's not Right. But we're trying to figure out uh, what this place does do. and yeah. what it wants to do and what kind of whiskey it wants to make. What and, percentage um, rye is your rye? 100 percent. All right. So I just want to let y'all know. So there's this concept. If you, if you do any reading, there's a Kentucky style bourbon of rye and there's the Maryland style of rye. Um, 
those traditions kind of came pre-prohibition. And Kentucky, like how many of you have had the old Forester ride that everyone thinks is like the greatest? It's, you know, 20 to 23 bucks. It's only 51% ride. And those are the rules, right? You can call something a straight rye as long as it's 50% more of rye. And so most Kentucky ryes, because they love their bourbon, uh, they want to make it as close to bourbon as possible. So they make it 51%. Maryland style, maybe a little bit more, maybe an average of 80. But a lot of the craft producers are really letting you taste the grain. And so if you have 100% rye, and you try to compare it to a 51% ride that's basically bourbon, 1% and be, it'd just be the old Forester product, yeah, it's going to taste different. It's supposed to, right? And so let's, you know, let's be educated and understand what it is that we're drinking before we try to cast judgment. Um, so we talked a little bit about your um, maturation process, your barrels, how they're different. Um, something that is extremely different that I'm not sure I've ever heard at a distillery before is you guys basically use a sweet mash process instead of sour mash. Mm -hmm. So sour mash is where you take a little bit of your spent grain after you do your fermentation process, you put it into the next, uh, you put it into your next batch of fermentation and that adds enzymes and makes the yeast happy so that they'll eat up all the sugar it changes the pH of the mash and all that stuff. And if you read any books, it'll tell you that that is how you create consistency in your whiskey. But here, uh, and by the way, if you use a sour mash process, you can do your fermentation in about three days, something like that. Uh, but here, they've paid, an, I don't know how much money, it's an outrageous amount of money to have extra fermenters so that they have enough fermenters to keep things on hand for longer while they're doing the fer fermentation process because they ferment on average seven days. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, and so you guys use the sour mesh process. Talk about that. Or, yeah, we're kind of- Not in, sour mesh, not, sorry, yeah, sweet, mesh. sweet mesh. Um, so yeah, we've kind of inverted. Our final pH is, is actually pretty low, but we go long and because we're not boiling, it's mostly lactic acid and ambient wild yeast that get in there, act on the, on the fermentation to dry it out, but also up the acid content, but it's different. Acid, anybody that's ever been in a bar that doesn't like to clean their countertops or um, anybody who's ever left beer out, acetic acid loves to come in on beer and finish eating up all the sugar that the Saccharomyces didn't turn into alcohol, but that makes vinegar. Um, vinegar is acetic acid. And I love acetone and ethyl acetate and all these, es all these esters and byproducts that come from having good acetic acid in a bourbon. Mm -hmm. um, all those really heady, you know, your airplane glue and your rubber cement. Those, I think those things are great. In, a, in the right context and the right proportions, I think that's gorgeous in a bourbon. But you don't get those similar notes from lactic acid buildup, um, which is a much more common scotch note and process. So we end up with all this uh, lactic acid as opposed to acetic. Um, that combined with pot still and a few other things, uh, we kind of ended up with a flavor profile that's influenced by a one tradition and yet even using it with American whiskey traditions ends up giving us a combination of kind of um, flavors and notes that just maybe have, just haven't been put together before in that way. Um, that I'm not even saying it's right or it's better, but it's interesting. It's and, y'all's uh, expression. It's, it's us and it's our, it's our place. Mm -hmm. and um this is art people yeah. this is art right so i mean it, you if if you want to go to an art gallery and everybody paints the same great but that's not how whiskey works right the people that are making this whiskey they've sacrificed tremendously to pursue this path and they're trying to express themselves through their art and their art is whiskey and they want to do something that's unique they want to show what the place, they want to show the terroir, they want to show their talent, they want to show, you know, everything. And that's why things are supposed to be different. So we, we, we talked about the sour mash, we talked about the maturation. Um, now, the, the grain that you guys use is, is also different. So you guys use a blue corn, and you, you, I think that corn is toasted. 
um, before <clears throat> it, it goes into the mash. So tell us about that. Why, why do you go through that process? Um, man, I'm blanking on the name of the drink. What's the name of the drink? Um, Make something up, our listeners. It's traditional. Don't know. I could probably find it pretty quick. There's a traditional cornmeal based, like hot drink. It's kind of like a hot chocolate thing, but it's kind of gritty, gritty. And um, oh man, yeah, it's gonna tip my tongue. But when we first started doing the blue corn whiskey, we were buying directly from a Hopi reservation. Mm -hmm. If you know anything about reservation agriculture, they grow what they need and kind of sell the excess externally. Um, so we went through in a few weeks <laughs> or a few months. The entire excess. You bought up all their excess. <laughs> we know it at the time until we go to put another order. They're like, yeah, you can yeah, call it out. back in like nine months. Yeah. Crap. So we started having it grown other places for a while. It was in the Midwest. Now it's back in Texas. Um, and, uh, but the, um, this very traditional, man, I wish I remember it. There's a traditional beverage that they would make out of this cornmeal that's roasted. And sometimes cocoa's added. Sometimes like some chili peppers are added. Um, and it's boiled up with milk, butter, cinnamon, like vanilla, all this stuff. It's delicious, like super creamy, like hot, cold weather drink. Um, but the very first batch we got of it was prepared already mm -hmm. for that beverage, which means it was already roasted and milled. Um, and so it, even later when we got unroast, un, uh, roasted samples and tried to like Make do like test batches yeah. with it, we were like, hmm. there was a nuttiness. There was a... I was just like all these layers, these extra layers of interest on the roasted stuff. So we just kind of stuck with that ever since. Yeah. Um, which has made us wonder even some other, I mean, what, what, what the possibilities are with other grains, which is our rye recipe is actually more akin to like an imperial stout beer recipe. It's hundred percent rye, but we have 20% um, of the recipe or so is some caramelized rye, uh, crystal rye, and we have chocolate and roasted. So we have all these kilning levels. It's almost like coffee roasting kind of, darker and darker and darker um, rye kilnings that we use in the recipe that give you all kind of um, at their lightest toasted bread all the way up to like raisins and bittersweet chocolate and um, maybe even coffee kind of notes um, that I think between beer background and then the roasted corn, some of those possibilities started seeming a little more interesting. And even people like Westland and a few other um, friends and peers of ours are doing interesting things where with their single malts, the American single malts are doing kind of more beer recipes mm -hmm. and modified stuff or different beer yeasts um, and not just distilling and yeast and all that kind of stuff. So. That actually reminds me. So uh, the Texas uh, distiller community is actually pretty friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys have uh, worked with the, forget what it's called texas whiskey association, texas whiskey association yeah. yeah and uh they've recently formed the texas whiskey trail yep. and you guys are stopping the texas whiskey mm -hmm. trail is that correct yep um and if you uh join as a member of the texas whiskey trail you get special treatment when you come here right yeah you get uh free tours at all the texas distilleries um we're working on what all the perks are gonna be obviously you get your membership card t-shirt wing care and all that stuff um we're in house. We're pers personally going to be working on some either some single barrels or some small batch blends that are exclusive. Like they're behind the counter. Nobody even gets to see them. But if you show up with your trail card, um, that there's some things for you to try and buy that are um, not available to anybody else. Um, the one of the funnest things that we've done with the trail already was for the Texas Whiskey Festival that happened in Austin a few weeks back. Um, there was uh, we worked with, we worked with three other distilleries on a blended whiskey, so it had some whiskey in it from Iron Root Republic up in Denison, um, Andalusia and Blanco and us, and Daniel Whittington uh, from Crowded Barrel and the Whiskey Vault Whiskey Tribe, all that stuff. Him and Jake Clemens, who puts on the show, they collaborated with all of us on putting this Texas blended whiskey together, uh, which kind of a a really successful first run at that mm -hmm. but i'm really excited about just with everybody on the trail what all the possibilities would be of um i don't know something like one of our single malt blends with the garrison guys come and put the blend together right or or you know, you know stuff like that where we get to even take one step further just watching people put their fingerprint on um just kind of the collective identity of what Texas whiskey is, can be, where it's going. Sure. All that. It's pretty fun. 
It's a fun time. I like that. So there are Texas distilleries um, that advertise as Texas distilleries that don't distill their own whiskey. Uh, but none of them are on the uh, Texas Whiskey Trail. So if you, like, I'm, I'm not trying to call anyone yep. out. You want to do some research, do some research. But I'm just saying everyone that's on the Texas Whiskey Trail is grain to glass. And, you know, it is a unique Texas expression. Obviously, they're not the same. I mean, I went out to Lone Elm. Their whiskey, I, I swear to God, I thought it was finished in a quart barrel. I tasted so much, like, raisin in it. It's not. That's just, you know, their wheat. That's what it tastes like. Uh, Iron Root, I swear to God, I thought I was eating caramel popcorn. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, it was, I was like, this tastes like caramel popcorn for sure. Um, and, you know, that stuff is beautiful. But I guess, you know, at the end of the day, what I want everyone to understand is you got to open your mind. You've got to let your palate judge. Stop comparing things to your preconceived notions. Open your minds and see whether or not, just based on flavor. And I'm going to be doing personally, because this is kind of a crusade of mine. Now it's become a crusade. I'm going to be doing a bunch of blind uh, sample packs. And as you know, I do a lot of blind sample packs, and you don't know what you're getting. Um, some of the blind sample packs I'm going to do, they're going to include some Texas whiskey. And guess what? You're going to like it more than the shit that you think you like, right? Because it's delicious, right? That's, that's the bottom line. So uh, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you think people need to know about your distillery of Texas whiskey in general? Uh, I was, I mean, I was talking about this just the other day with someone else. The people involved in this industry on production end and consuming, um, I think we're all pretty diverse folks. We have a lot of different interests. Um, and they get, I don't really care if someone does or doesn't like whiskey. That's not your thing. Or even spirits in general. Like, that's right. fine. Yeah. Um, I, I think the things that we find exciting about it and that motivate us to get up every day and go to work and keep working and continue to be curious and try things and explore everything that this trade has to offer, they're applicable to food. They're applicable to music. You mentioned painting earlier. Like, it's all the same. Um, we talked about divisions and fragmented kind of, you know, community situation that we're in. But I think another kind of uh, unintended consequence of the industrial revolution is this this inclination to specialize, and yet uh, most of us, a lot of us, just kind of inherently rebel against that. Like, no, I have a bunch of things I'm interested in, and so even for me, I make whiskey for a living. That's what I've dedicated myself to. But I'm also like, I love music just as much. I love, uh, you know, when I was younger, I thought I was going to be a potter, and you know, my mentor and teacher, we sell his handmade whiskey glasses here at the store, and like. Talk, getting to talk to people that have like side interests, you know, guy was here earlier and like thought he moved to LA thinking he was going to do music and now he's in the whiskey business. That is so rich to me. And so if someone wants to nerd out about barbecue right. or wine right. or cigars right. or shit, sunsets, right. for God's sake, <laughs> I don't care. It doesn't matter. Like, your shit's your shit. Life's crazy. And there's so much to notice and pay attention to and enjoy and appreciate. Just do it. You know, like if, 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 if it's not whiskey, I don't, I don't. It doesn't matter to me. Or I know whiskey guys that don't drink beer. And I'm just like, man, beer is like amazing. Or like people I'm don't one. drink whiskey, <laughs> you know? Uh, people don't drink wine. Right. But it doesn't really matter. I mean, that's not, that's irrelevant. The goal of, I mean, I think everybody's goal in life is to be happy, right? Right. I, I assume so. Whatever yeah. that means. And you define it for yourself. And some people, it is a mission. It is like going after something. And someone else, it's serving people. And someone else, it's just like getting as much crap as I can. Whatever it is. But most people just, we're trying to, be, maybe not happy, maybe at peace, maybe satisfied, content, mm -hmm. maybe is better than happy. Um, and uh, that it has, there's, yeah, there's so many components to what make up yeah, a content, happy life. And you, they're different for everyone. For me, whiskey is a part of that. A good drink is a part of that. And it can be wine, it can be beer, it can be whiskey. Um, I love having people in that their significant others like, yeah, I don't really drink whiskey. And it's like, cool, like, man, let someone make your cocktail or let me when I used to have the beer bar with me, <clears throat> my previous job, like someone came in and said they don't drink beer. It's like, 
cool, personal mission. I'm going to find something <laughs> that will blow your mind. And I want you to leave here going, I didn't know beer could be like that. You right. know? And I, we want to do the same with whiskey for people. And, uh, and if it's still not your thing, great. Just, just wake up and walk out into the world intentionally, thoughtfully, um, be present and that's what that's that's all this is about and for us that happens to be applied to whiskey so it can be anything you know so i would like for you all to collectively say amen because that was just a sermon and my dad's a minister so i mean it's awesome i <clears throat> used to be a youth pastor um so the i mean did you all get that like you know this guy he's making texas whiskey but he's also given sermons because <laughs> this is all about passion like i want y'all to so for me, if you want more information about Bourbon Real Talk, you can get more info at bourbonrealtalk.com. You can sign up to be a show guest if you think you got a good story. You can give me show suggestions. You can provide feedback. You can tell me that I suck. You can tell me that I'm awesome. Whatever. I'm okay with, with whatever. You can go to Instagram forward slash, is that the forward slash, forward slash, Bourbon Real Talk. You can go to Facebook forward slash Bourbon Real Talk. Um, there's plenty of ways to get in contact with me. If people want to get in contact with Balconies, uh, where should they go? Yeah, balconiesdistilling.com. Um, obviously, feel free to come by if you're ever even remotely close to Waco. If you're ever going between Dallas and Austin, we're right in between. We're literally like a minute and a half off the highway on I-35. Don't have a super big excuse for not coming by. Um, yeah, jump on the website. We're doing tours. We have special events in fall and spring for uh, releases. We have distillery only releases happening all the time. Music at the distillery. Um, we have our, our quarterly masterclass cycle where we walk through whiskey appreciation into distillation into maturation and kind of culminates in this blending class where you get to make your own blend and walk out with bottles that you, you put together. Um, there's, a, there's a ton of opportunity to interact and engage um, and uh, we prefer that over you just being, you know, walking in the store or walking in the bar and while we appreciate you walking in the store and walking in the bar and buying stuff, we'd much rather, you know, have it be a conversation and have it be uh, interactive. Um, so yeah, please come see us. It's a good chance. Awesome. All right, so just remember, if you're unsure whether or not anyone else loves you, hmm. I love you. Don't forget that. If you don't know anything, reach out to me. We'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk.